This week on Q&A, our guest is S.E. Cup, an author, columnist, and television commentator. S.E. Cup, could you tell us uh, how you would describe what you do for a living? Oh, gosh. Um, sort of a hodgepodge. Um, I, I consider myself a writer by trade. Um, and I'll always be a writer, regardless of what the topic. Obviously, I'm concentrating on politics right now, but I like to write about religion and culture and sports. Um, I do television because it promotes my writing. Um, if television went away tomorrow, I think I'd be okay with it. Um, but uh, I, I do radio for the same purpose, to promote my writing. Uh, I don't blog. I, uh, I just I, I find it more interesting to, to sit down and really think out a cogent argument and, and try and get it somewhere published um, rather than sort of on my own website. Um, I do have a website, but I, uh, I post my, my published pieces there. I wrote a book and I have another one coming out in the spring. Um, so that's basically, that's basically it. I think I have my fingers in a couple different pots. On your website, yeah. S.E. Cup. Mm -hmm. Here's a quote from Nick Hornby. Who yeah. he is? Who is Nick Hornby? Uh, he's a great British author. Um, American audiences probably know him from the movie versions of his books about a boy, fever pitch, um, high fidelity. Um, he's just a really wonderful, lovely author. Um, sort of captures, uh, I'd say, late 90s kind of um, uh, ethos. And I ran into him at a Chicago Cubs game. He's a huge sports fan. And I told him I was, I was a big fan. And we had this great sort of memorable meeting. And um, a while later, this, this thing pops up online where he's talking about reading my book and, and that experience of meeting me, which I, it was, you know, shocking to me and, and humbling. But he's, he's a very cool guy. I was, I was honored that he even remembered me. <laughs> He says her name is S.E. Cup, mm -hmm. a charming right-wing sports fanatic. How many of those does one meet during the course of a lifetime? Yeah, probably not too many. What is that? Why not? I don't know. I mean, I guess, you know, you have the, the Keith Olbermans on the left. Um, you know, he's a big sports fan. But I know plenty. I mean, just look at Rush Limbaugh. He's entertaining the idea of going back to football. Um, so, of course, we exist, but I think it's always interesting for, for outsiders when conservatives don't adhere to the kind of stereotypical, um, you know, outline of the way that they're supposed to behave or look or sound or dress or, or you know, anything like that. So I, I understood his, his shock. On another page in your, uh, on your website, it says, this is from... S.E.'s college friend. S.E. <laughs> punched me in the head one time and nearly broke my eardrum. She never officially apologized, but I'm pretty sure she's sorry. Now, you put that on there. I um, no, I asked for a quote from a very good friend of mine, a college friend, and that's what he gave me. And yeah. I am sorry. Um, Do you want to name him? His name is Lyle. He knows who he is. College where? Cornell. But that's the sort of thing, I mean, um, my site is irreverent, my writing is, is irreverent at times, and I wanted to capture that on the website so it wasn't just another right-wing, you know, staid, boring website. It also says, I always knew that kid was going places, S.E.'s dad. Yeah, my dad gave me that one. That was a good one. <laughs> Who's your dad? Uh, his name is Ken. He's from Kentucky. Um, grew up blue-collar. Um, maybe even collarless, um, moved around a lot, put himself through school, um, went from a, a stock boy in a warehouse to become a vice president of a, of a major Fortune 500 company over 40 plus years of working for the same company. Um, Which one? It was Office Max. It was originally Boise Cascade and then it merged with, with Office Max. Um, so he's sort of my, my role model in terms of hard work, personal responsibility, um, sort of taking responsibility for, for your obligations and for where you're going in life, regardless of the hand that you were dealt. We have a picture that you, we ask you to bring pictures, and you yeah. brought one here of your mother. Mm -hmm. um, 
I have it right here. Yeah. What is this? Um, my mom, I think, at, at that time was 17 or 16. She was involved with the Girl Scouts. She's from New Jersey. And they took a trip into uh, to New York City one day, and, and they took their, their portraits outside of the Statue of Liberty. And I just think it's such a great patriotic moment uh, for my mom. And she just looked so... Uh, so hopeful and and young and wide-eyed. <laughs> is she right wing like you? She is, um, but I didn't know that until very recently. In fact, um, it's kind of like I just met my parents a couple of years ago, <laughs> because I really did not grow up in a political household, um, and it wasn't until I came out as as a as a conservative that I started asking them what their political beliefs were and. We sort of all discovered at the same time that we were conservative, and it was, like I said, uh, you know, surprising. <laughs> where did you, where do you think you got your first conservative inkling? I mean, I was raised, um, again, with, you know, personal responsibility, compassion, hard work ethic. Um, I was raised to be independent. So I think that was sort of viscerally in me. But um, it, it really wasn't until college um, where, I, where I decided or discovered that I was probably more conservative than, than most people around me, certainly more, more conservative than the, the kids I went to school with and, and the professors. Um, I, I attended a, a debate between two professors on affirmative action early on in my freshman year and found myself siding with the conservative viewpoint. And I, I made a conscious decision to say, if, if that's conservatism, then I want to explore that a little more. And so I did. What conservative principle do you endorse first? I, I mean, the three tenets that I have always found inspiring are fiscal responsibility, limited government, and, and reducing taxes. I think, I know they're all essentially economically based, but taxes affect my day-to-day -day life a lot more than you know, reproductive rights um, do. So I've never really gravitated to those, those values issues, even though I think they're incredibly important. Um, I've just always been drawn to the, the, uh, the starve the beast kind of um, limit the government uh, reach kind of ethic. Um, I think people, because I'm young, want to be reassured that I came upon conservatism via, you know, Hayek or Buckley. And I certainly, you know, have, have read all of that, but it's really much more guttural for me. It's much more visceral. It's, it wasn't a, an academic highbrow decision to become a conservative a la Barry Goldwater or, or someone else like that, even though I admire them. It was just, um, this feels right. This feels like these principles make sense. It feels like they're best for everyone, um, so it it was it was much more natural and I think organic. Born in Carlsbad, California, yeah. raised in Andover, Massachusetts. Yeah, went to school in Ithaca, New York. <laughs> Live where now? Manhattan, New York City. What part? I live in Chelsea. Very blue, very liberal. I love it. Um, but yeah, I've always lived in liberal places. I don't know why. Um, I love traveling south of the Mason-Dixon line. It's always fun for me. I feel like I'm in friendly territory, but I don't know. I've just always gone where the work is, and, you know, my, my work is in New York right now. When could we have seen you in the Boston Ballet? Oh, geez. Um, I was there for maybe five years. I danced for about ten years with the Washington Ballet as well. Um, I trained in Washington and in Boston and danced in the Nutcracker and a couple of other performances with the Boston Ballet, but it was certainly what I thought I was going to be doing with the rest of my life. When did you change your mind? I was 18 and, um, you know, you come to that fork in the road where you have to either say college or I'm going to really go after this. And it was just um, clear to me after that much time that I, I wanted to pursue other things. So I did, and I sort of closed that chapter. I haven't been to a ballet since. I haven't taken a class. I haven't pirouetted. Um, it's, you know, an old, old book closed. <laughs> One of the things you read in your book, why you're wrong about the right, mm -hmm. uh, and also other places, is you say you are an atheist. I am. But I'm not a militant atheist. I've never really understood the, the angry atheist. Um, I... 
have been an atheist for quite a while. I, I was fascinated by religion at a very young age, and my parents always encouraged me to explore my religious uh, inclinations. And I went to a Catholic high school, and um, I just decided early on that I, I, I didn't buy it. It wasn't for me. But I'm envious. I'm envious of the faithful. So I defend the faithful, especially the Christian right in America, um, at every opportunity I get. And in fact, my next book um, really deals with Christianity and the Christian right uh, head on, getting my master's in religious studies. So it's always going to be something that I'm studying, exploring, and open to. I haven't, I haven't closed the door on, on faith. I, it just hasn't found me yet. Explain what an atheist is, in your opinion. Well, for me, I just, I really don't believe in a higher power of any kind. Um, I, you know, no deity whatsoever. I really believe that when I die, I go in the ground like every other animal, and and that's that. Um, Where'd we come from? I, I think, I think ev I'm an evolutionary believer. I, I believe that science has answered that question adequately enough for me. Um, if, if evolution gets sort of rewritten or tweaked over the next hundred years, then, then great. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll tweak my own ideas as well. But I, um, I just could never fill that hole, the gaps in our knowledge with some unseen, uh, supernatural being. It just doesn't make sense to me. Have you ever stood up in front of a conservative group and said this? Oh, yes. I, I don't hide it. Because well, I, I want to be I mean, honest. What's the reaction, though, when you're amongst all of your true believers that yeah. follow you? Well, it's interesting. I mean, conservatism is very intellectually diverse. So libertarians, for example, really enjoy that I'm, I'm an atheist. Um, you know, the religious right, I get, I get people who are surprised and saddened and shocked and angry. And then I get people who genuinely want to see me sort of evolve in my, in my religious journey. Um, and I'm open to that, and I really respect that. So I, I, never, I never put down um, the faith or religion or Christianity. I really aspire to be a person of faith one day. But if you don't believe in a God, yeah. and that the God never existed and doesn't, and you're going right. into the ground and it's all over, why would you believe any of the rest? I mean, the people you, the, more people who follow uh, the conservative philosophy believe and don't believe by a long shot. Well, that's true of the country. I mean, the country is 98% religious and 80% Christian. It's not just true on the right. I mean, there are Christian Democrats, of course. Um, so I, I, I've never found it to be a problem being a conservative who isn't a believer. Um, it's a problem for some people. It just isn't a problem for me because I'm not an, a militant atheist. I have a great respect for the religious right, you know, ecumenically, um, and a great respect for people of faith. Well, go to George Bush for a minute. Yeah. First of all, what do you think of him? I'm a fan. I, I don't mind saying I'm a fan of George Bush. Why? Um, I think he had a conviction, uh, personal principles, that uh, required him to answer to someone else when he went to bed at night, uh, not to the state and not to himself. I don't see the same kind of um, the same kind of reverence in some of our other recent presidents, Barack Obama included, Bill Clinton included. Um, that gives me comfort as a citizen, knowing that my president is going to bed answering to a higher power. So he's thinking about the decisions he's making, not just because they're going to affect him and his legacy, but because he has someone or something to answer to. I really respect that. And I think that whether you liked his policies or not, he really did what he thought was best for the country. And I think that's really, really rare. Um, Do you think Barack Obama is doing what he thinks no. bad for the country? Oh, no, I don't think he's making conscious decisions to, to be a bad president. Absolutely not. I think he's a true believer in some of his, his policies. And, and that's fine, but I also think Barack Obama doesn't have a lot of, um, he doesn't have a lot of his own convictions. I think they've been informed by 
academia and sort of the Chicago community organizing circuit and so many different influences that I don't really think he has a visceral um, feeling on a great many issues. That's problematic for me because I think he's easily influenced. Go back to uh, George Bush though. He read the Bible every day. Right. And often said that this higher power was what was guiding him and making decisions. Right. If you don't believe it all, why yeah. would you then follow somebody that has that as their way of life? As an atheist, I could never imagine electing, voting for an atheist president for exactly those reasons. I mean, religion keeps a person it, who is endowed with so much power honest. Um, this is a person who's answering to a higher power every night and not to the state. He doesn't think the state has all the power and he doesn't think he, he himself has all the power. That's important to me. I mean, I represent 2% of the world. Why would I, why would I want someone who thinks that 98% of the world is crazy running the country? But you don't think that that higher power exists? I don't, but I don't think people are crazy. I, get, I, I understand the allure of religion. I really do. I'm just, I'm just not going to be dishonest and say that I believe in something that I don't yet. But what if he's hearing voices all the time and taking advice from a higher power that doesn't exist in your opinion and makes decisions based on the higher power that doesn't exist in your opinion? Well, I mean, people's faith is very personal and I don't judge um, the way that people use their faith to inform their decisions. I really don't. Um, we can judge him on his policies whether he heard it from a voice in his head, he got it from the Bible, he had a conversation with Laura one night over dinner. I mean, it doesn't really matter to me. I'd like to judge the policies on, on face value. Go back to your three principles. Mm -hmm. One of them was cutting taxes. Yeah. One of them was limited government. Right, and oh, fiscal responsibility. Fiscal responsibility. Yeah. How do, what kind of a grade do you give George Bush on fiscal responsibility? C. What kind of a grade do you give him on taxes? C. And what kind of grade do you give him on limited government? B plus. How do you figure? On the last one? Yeah. I think the contrast has become increasingly clear um, just in the months since Obama's been elected. This seems to be an administration, I'm only talking about Obama to put Bush in, in perspective, but seems to be an administration that has no problem, wildly overreaching um, into the, the private sector. It's scary, in fact, how um, easily they can sort of reach their hands into your back pocket. Um, whether it's, you know, uh, luring you into buying a, a car that you probably don't need right now, um, or it's telling you what you can study in school or that you need to volunteer. I mean, it's, it's really, um, I think, un unprecedented. If you compare that to Bush's administration, despite the Patriot Act, which I think was an issue of national security, there really wasn't this interest in expanding the role of government. I think he expanded the role of the executive, but that's because we were living in a, I think, a, a really unique moment. Um, but it, you know, people right now are talking about the fairness doctrine, and you have this groundswell of support from the left for the fairness doctrine. You didn't see that in the Bush administration. There, there was a hands-off kind of, kind of uh, a policy that I appreciated, especially um, in contrast to, to what we're seeing now. You are studying at New York University yeah. for a master's degree right. in religious studies. Right. It's actually an independent program. I call it religious studies because I can call it whatever I want. Um, but basically, I'm, I'm doing a comparison study between the devotional practices of the faithful against the devotional practices of sports fans. So for the past five years, I've been studying those two uh, systems in an academically rigorous way. So my thesis is not going to be a, you know, funny, you know, irreverent. It's going to be, I think, pretty boring. But... Um, you know, informed by the usual academic, you know, Durkheim and Weber and stuff that you'll never really use again. But I've had a really interesting time with it um, because I'm a huge sports fan. I'm fascinated by religion and comparing these two systems on their sort of components has been shockingly 
um, fascinating. They're so similar in, in many ways. So it's been a real joy for me. So why all this time on religion? What's the, and when did you decide you needed a master's in religious studies or independent religious studies? I want to, I want to write about big issues and I am not so egomaniacal to think that I have all the answers yet. I don't. Um, these are big topics and I kind of want some gravitas, you know, I, I'm writing books and I'm, I'm trying to get my, sort of my, my, my foothold in, um, you know, serious writing and, and scholarship, as well as the fun punditry kind of stuff. I mean, I love commenting on culture and, and that's, that's great, but I really am invested in scholarship of, of religion and, and culture and sociology and anthropology to answer some of the big questions. Not that I'm gonna come up with these answers, but I, I enjoy the exercise of trying to scratch the surface. Who which writer are you most impressed with when it comes to the whole subject of religion? Hmm. Well, um, it's 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 always interesting. You know, when I when I was in college undergrad, I was studying art history, and anytime I think you study theory, you kind of kill you kill the subject. I mean, art history was a lure for me because it was I thought for the masses, art was to be enjoyed for everyone, and then I come upon this theory that really only exists to separate the classes. And the same is true, I think, with religious, um, with religious studies. So you read Foucault and Derrida and, and Durkheim and Weber, like I said, and, and these are all fascinating, fascinating um, scholars. But they really don't help inform me on questions of American faith and practice. And that's what I'm interested in. So I like to read The Case for Faith, for example, or C.S. Lewis. I, I don't mean to demean them as, as less than scholarly, because they are scholarly, but I, I have not found um, many of the answers in graduate school, I have to say. Has there ever been a moment in your studies where you stopped and said, well, maybe there is a supreme being? No, certainly not in my studies. And my study, my studies push, pushes me in the complete opposite direction. It's when I spend time with my family and when I spend time with friends who are believers, um, whether they're Jewish or Muslim. Um, my father is born again. My mother's a, a Roman Catholic. Um, Do you talk about all this at home? Oh, yes. Vil vigilantly. I mean, we, we love to talk about it. What do they say to you about your views? Well, my father wishes I were saved, of course. And I really respect and admire that. But he also respects my, my decisions. Um, and my mom's sort of okay with whatever, just as long as I'm a good person and don't swear on television. <laughs> um, but uh, it's when I'm around believers that I find myself more curious, uh, more envious. I, I get jealous. I, I think it's really a wonderful thing to be a believer. Um, but I, I realize that I can't force it. So I'm just open. I'm open to it. And I have some friends who are very, very spiritual and they think that I'm, you know, sort of going to be a, a conduit one day and <laughs> maybe God's just waiting for the right time for me. When did you go from Sarah Elizabeth Cup to S.E. Yeah. Cup? In college, I was writing for my, um, my college newspaper and I thought it would be, I don't know, interesting. Um, to be gender anonymous. I don't know why, but I did. And I was, from then on, always published as S.E. Cup. And that gender anonymity was actually very useful at times. But then I started doing television, so now it's just some kind of affect, <laughs> some kind of obnoxious affect, but it, it is what it is. It, it stuck, so. Okay, another, um, I guess it's not incongruous, but it's, mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. You work for the New York Times. I do. Doing what? Dun, dun, dun. Um, yeah, I, I work internally. I write internally. So I'm not on the editorial board. I'm not published in the New York Times, which is how I can write for all of these competing publications. Um, it's, a, it's a desk job. It's great. I write about sports for a, a reference section within the Times. Um, I've been there about eight years. Are you in the big building? We're not. We're in an annex. 
in Manhattan. Um, so it's really separate. I feel very separated from the New York Times. Um, but it's, a, it's been a great company to work for, regardless of what I think of their editorial decisions. Um, they've really, you know, taken care of me, and I'm grateful to have the job. <laughs> you appear on that late night, early morning show on Fox. I think you're talking about Red Eye. I am talking about yeah. Red Eye. 3 a.m. in the morning, or is it 2 a.m.? Which 3 a.m. Eastern, yeah. And on there is a character that they have a little puppet called Pinch. Pinch. Right, which is uh, sort of a, an homage to the New York Times. Because? Um, because they like to make fun of the New York Times. But what is the word pinch? Oh, from Punch, from um, Sulzberger, publisher. His son, Pinch. Exactly. That they his call nickname. him. It's not, it's not his nickname, it's what others call him. Well, his nickname is Punch, and so the, the red eye paper is Pinch. <laughs> And do you get any static from the New York Times because of all these associations? No, frankly, I don't think they know that I exist, really. I mean, I, you know, I, I come in, I do my job for the Times, I leave and I do other work. I, I don't really know that they, they have uh, an eye on me at all, which is just fine. <laughs> if you type in S.E. Cup on the Internet, mm -hmm. There is some video on there of um, you for about a minute and 15 seconds. We're going to run it, oh, and dear. I want you, yeah, let's okay. run it. And I know that it looks, looks like it's in your bathroom. Oh, yes, I know what you're talking about. Okay, okay. Let, let's run it, and you can tell me what it is. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just getting ready for, uh, for work. I wanted to welcome you all to the first annual SGP Twitter Ball. Very exciting. I'm Essie Cup. And uh, I want to thank you for inviting me to participate in this. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's really an honor, um, especially after the past year or so when we, um, you know, we saw how integral um, online media was in, in rallying people to get behind our eventual winner, our eventual winner-in-chief. Um, and how women were treated in the past election. I think um, it's really an eye-opening experience, and so it's really an amazing thing and, and a wonderful thing that we're all coming together for, for the same goal to make next year and the next year and the next year a um, hundred times better. Um, and, uh, you know, you guys are, are completely integral in that process. So um, thanks for having me. Check out my book, Why You're Wrong About the Right. And um, I'll be seeing you guys around. Bye. How, how did you do that? Um, well, logistically, I put a camera up. Um, On your mirror? Yeah, I opened the um, medicine cabinet. Right. Put that on there. The, the, the girls at, at uh, Smarkle Politics asked me to do something very off the cuff. Smart girl politics. Right. What's that to start with? Um, there are sort of a organizational, uh, you know, grassroots um, online venture to, to galvanize young conservative women. Um, and they asked me to do something off the cuff, unprepared, hopefully in my home. So I just turned it on while I was like getting ready for the day. Um, I don't think it's a particularly scholarly moment. But, you know, we don't always have to be, um, you know, reading our our Wall Street Journal and sipping our you know caramel macchiatos you know in the what, New York what, coffee shop what, all the time what's that I don't know it's something that these people drink yeah. I drink my coffee black but I, I hear there are ca caramel macchiatos so but th <laughs> this is a as you know I mean you, you were born three weeks before this network started you may not know that in the mm -hmm. old days this kind of thing never would happen sure a video of you wouldn't be instantly available click sure. on Google What's this world do for you? Are you live in a different kind of environment than old guys like me? Well, it is a different environment. I mean, as you say, I can communicate with thousands of people instantly, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook. You and, feel that? Well, yeah. I, I, I resisted it for quite a while because, frankly, I'm a bit of a misanthrope. I, I don't really, I don't have a huge group of friends. I like to keep my circle pretty small. So I'm, I'm not a big networker. So I really resisted it until it became clear that for my job, um, promoting my work is, is important and it's a great way to do that. If I ever stopped 
doing this kind of work, I would probably not be on Twitter or Facebook or any of those kinds of things. Where did that video go? Who did you ship it that to? That was on Twitter. SGP was doing a Twitter ball, which is some kind of live Twitter event uh, where people tune in to see videos and people talk and people live Twitter. I don't, I, you, I, I don't know. Um, so I submitted it for that. I'm happy to do these things. It's just, it's, it's foreign to me as well, because I, I really resisted that whole, that whole thing for, for quite a while. If, you just look, if you're just out looking for S.E. Cup, mm -hmm. you find pictures of you holding rifles. Yeah, uh-huh. Shooting, actually. Yes. I mean, there's a picture right there of you. Where is that? Oh, that was hunting two years ago, upstate New York, um, November. It was deer season real early in the morning, maybe 4 or 5 a.m. I did not bag a buck that day. Bag but it was, a buck. Yeah, I didn't get a, I didn't get a buck, why but it you, was a great day. Why do you do that? Why, what's the draw for you? Um, well, I love shooting. Um, ideally, I, I skeet shoot. That's, that's what I love. I love the moving targets. There, I'm, I'm skeet shooting um, in Dallas at a range in Dallas. Where'd you learn to do that? Um, I, I just... Uh, took a couple lessons at a, at a range in Manhattan, actually. There's an indoor range in Manhattan. And uh, with, with a rifle, you can only shoot a rifle at that, that range unless you're, you're licensed. And I loved it. I instantly loved target shooting. So I kept exploring other, other venues, skeet and, and hunting and, and target shooting. And I just fell in love with it. I mean, there's something about having the gun in your hand. There's something about being outside and away from the city. and it feels very primal. Um, it's why I love fishing too, because I can pull fish out of the stream and cut them up and, and grill them. There I'm in Alaska. I'm just outside Fairbanks. Um, Sounds like you had a pretty good life. Manhattan, Dallas, uh, Alaska, I don't, all this. I don't, uh, I don't accumulate a lot of stuff. I like to travel. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a materialistic person, um, so my apartment's not full of crazy things. I travel a lot. Because I want those experiences. We try to go to the Salmon Run um, every fall in Alaska. Um, there I'm in Morocco on assignment. That was actually for work in uh, Western Sahara, disputed territory south of Morocco proper. For New York Times work? No, it was for um, the, a think tank in D.C., the Religion and Public Policy Institute, uh, wanted to do a press tour, so they invited me to go and I came home and, and wrote about the experience for a number of publications. But I just, I love to travel. I love to get out and, and see the world and especially see this country. I've, I think I've been to 48 states. Um, I think there's nothing better than really getting to know the country you live in. Did, would your parents be able to explain why you've gotten yourself into all this? Does that make sense to them? No, it doesn't. They don't know who I am. Um, they're shocked. I, you know, I certainly was not raised hunting and fishing, even though my dad did a lot of that as a kid. Um, it, it was not how I was raised. That's, that's daddy. Um, Are there others in your family? Um, Are there I, children? I have some, I have uh, two stepsisters and two stepbrothers. And uh, we're all, you know, around the same age in our, in our 30s and uh, love to get together. And I have a niece now, which is, which is nice and fun. Um, but no, I think they're surprised. But I've always kind of found my own way. Um, Back to your website. Yeah. Here is, uh, this is the fan. S.E. after eight years of supporting the worst president in our nation's history, which forgive me if I assume you did support him, how about doing something constructive? I get horrendous really? fan mail. I mean, yeah. fan mail. It's, it's mostly hate mail. Um, which is not to say that I don't get really lovely, supportive fan mail, because I do, but... The hate mail I get, um, I publish on my website, um, minus the mail that I forward off to the FBI, uh, because I think it's really funny and, and, uh, and illustrative of just how angry the left is. I find it really surprising that they've managed to paint conservatives as the angry mob when I get some of the stuff that I do on a, on a daily basis, um, you know, calling me all kinds of names just for the, the policies that I espouse. Well, let's try some, some okay. of this. I found this on your... First of all, uh, 
this quote is on the top of the page where you have all of these uh, bloggers or people responding mm. to you. That girl plays her music way too loudly. <laughs> that was my neighbor. Is that true? I, I used to. I've gotten better. Here it is. Here's from somebody named, no, oh, this isn't a good one. It's anonymous. And by the way, who are you? I've never seen such an, uh, an emergence of a no-name conservative commentators in all my life. I guess all you have to do to get on faux news these days is come up with some outrageously stupid equivalents and boom, you're now an authority. Well, congratulations to you, Miss C, S-E-E, -E, Cup. Uh, you've done your part to stomp the discourse down just a little deeper in the muck. That falls in the category of condescending. I get a lot of that. Um, I get a lot of a sort of, you know, you'll grow out of this one day. Um, I don't know where you get off, you know, t pretending to be an expert. I'm not an expert, but I have opinions and I'm allowed to voice them. People are very indignant that I have any kind of platform at all as a, as a young female conservative. Absolutely indignant. This one comes from Jerry Moyer. Actually, he signed this. Uh-huh. Jerry. Yep, and I published his name. <laughs> and to blame Obama on top of it is asinine, you moron, LOL. Uh-huh, yeah. Is that lots out, laugh out loud? Laugh out loud, and hilarious. Not, not lots of love. No, not lots of love. Do you realize how stupid you looked on Hannity, LOL? Laugh out loud again. <laughs> You want to condemn incivility, listen to Mark Levin, sometime whose personal attacks on Nancy Stretch Pelosi and Little Dick Durbin is only a sampling of his outrageous crudeness, and he's not even a comedian or an entertainer, but you do hear Pelosi whining. No, for a fairly good-looking babe, you're pathetically stupid. Best, Jerry. Right, so that actually falls into a number of categories. One is um, you should be directing this this tirade to apparently Mark Levin. I don't know why I'm getting the, the, uh, the, the rant against Mark Levin's tirades. Another category is the, you know, you're good looking, but, um, which is pretty cheap and, and offensive, but I get those. And then the other category is you're stupid. You know, you don't know anything, but that's, I mean, this is just, this is uh, the tried and true stuff. Except if we look on your websites and around, we see these different pictures of you. Yeah. We see the one that looks somewhat like you do now with the glasses. Yes. Then we see another and? one where you have blonde hair. Right. And then we see, another, I mean, they're, they look, they're fashion shots and all. I mean, you, you obviously must know your. They're headshots. I mean, I, I'm a professional and I had professional photos taken. I'm fully clothed and will always be. Um, there are promotional shots for my work. I mean, I'm on television. I'm selling books. Uh, so, I, you know, if you're implying that I'm kind of trying to market myself in a certain kind of way, I'm not. This is what I look like. <laughs> but let me ask the question this way. If you didn't do all that you do yeah. in your marketing, would people buy your writing alone? Oh, gosh, I hope so. I mean... But you must notice that people react to all this that I'm, we're talking about here. Well, they do, but I also get a lot of comments on my writing. I don't know who this guy thinks he is. So I know that some of these people don't know who I am, don't know if I'm a, a man or a woman even, don't know what I look like. Um, so I, I, uh, I take comfort in knowing that I, I, I believe my work speaks for itself. I mean, I'm published in the Washington Post and Town Hall and and Slate and Human Events and American Spectator and the Daily News and I don't think that I'm getting column space because of the way I look, at least I hope not. Here's one from Clifford McKinstry, again, you, he identifies himself. Yeah. Obviously your brain is dead and like <laughs> all repubs, you take no responsibility for anything done wrong ever, just look at the Bush disaster and the rest of the nuts you people endorse. Yeah, I mean... What category do you put him in? Um, this is a guy who I, I get a lot of this just anti-Bush stuff. Um, because I'm a Republican, I must be a Bush supporter, and I must be anti-Obama just because I'm a Republican, and, and, and that's, that's, that's it. That's the meme. How far do you have to go to find people that think like you, that are your same age, that want to engage in thinking about the world and the issues? How hard is it? Um, it's not that hard. It's hard in Manhattan. 
Um, but it's not that hard, really, and especially because of Facebook and Twitter, we can find each other virtually. So I hear from people all over the country, you know, um, who are, I think, grateful that someone young is putting a new kind of spin on conservative uh, philosophy, um, talking about things in a different way, maybe. Uh, I think there are a lot of people out there my age that, that, are, that are women um, who want a new dialogue. And I, I really haven't had to search very hard. They've well, found me. Let me ask you about the issue of money, because you brought that up earlier mm -hmm. about restrictive, I mean, uh, limited government. Mm -hmm. And George, during George Bush's time, we doubled our deficit by $5 trillion. Right. Early on in the Obama administration, we're already up to... 11, 12 trillion, we've already, you know, mm -hmm. we're on our way to maybe even doubling it again. Mm -hmm. What does somebody your age think about your future when it comes to whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, yeah. Social Security, taxes, 401ks, all that? Well, I think the, the baby boomer generation has been wildly irresponsible um, with, with our future, my future. Um, I think that once many of them sort of hung up their, their, hippie, their hippie shoes and traded them in for, for their running shoes and their, you know, yuppie cappuccinos, um, they, they threw all kinds of caution out the window. Um, I think they got caught up in the excess and the me generation kind of politics and policies. And I'm going to have to pay for it. My generation is going to have to pay for it. And the following generation how? is going to have to pay how? for it. Well, I don't know. I mean, it depends on how the next three years go and, and how the next seven years go. I mean, it depends on how irreparable this damage becomes. But depending on which figure you use, it's between 65 and $70 yeah. trillion dollar liability. Right. We're, and everybody that studies this says you, we can't grow out of this. So what do we do? I mean, are we, is your life going to be less expansive? Do you have fewer things? Um, or does it matter to you? Well, I don't know that it matters to me personally. I mean, I can take a vested interest in the future of the, you know, the country. But um, I think that we're going to have to make some tough decisions. And by we, I mean my generation my generation is going to have to cut back where this generation is not. We're going to have to learn from the past mistakes and say, all right, thanks, mom and dad. Not personally my mom and dad, but thanks, mom and dad. And thanks, gran grandpa and grandma. But uh, we're going we're gonna to do things differently now. We have to have the courage to do that, though. I think it's really hard to stop once you've gotten into that cycle of spend, spend, spend. What kind of a grade would you give the Republican Congress? I mean, and one of the things in your book, mm -hmm. one of your heroes is Newt Gingrich. Yeah, I like, I mean, I don't know that he's a hero. I mean, we interviewed him along with 30 other um, interesting conservatives on all sides of the spectrum. Uh, I think Newt Gingrich is a really galvanizing figure. He's very smart, incredibly smart. Um, I think... Uh, Would you support him for president? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm reluctant to say who the future of the party is, because any time you do that, that person automatically gets sort of a bullseye on their back. And I think it's too early. Uh, I'd rather be a, a coalition right now, have no leader, and figure out what our message is before we figure out what the messenger you, is going Who would be your like. favorite symbol of the party today? I mean, give me somebody that's out there. God, I like Sarah Palin. I like Mitt Romney. Um, I like Mike Huckabee. I mean, these are all, I think, really interesting people and all potentially great leaders. But I don't know what the country is going to look like in three years. But you, you have focused on fiscal conservatism. Yeah. And would you say that the Republican-led Congress back 95 on was a conservative, fiscally no. conservative? No. Well, why would you then think in the future they're going to be? Well, I think that because of the recent financial crisis, there's more of an eye on it, whether it's Michael Moore shining a light on, on capitalism and corporate greed, or it's coming from the right, um, sort of the Wall Street Journal ethic shining a light on, on fiscal irresponsibility. Everyone's eyes are on this now. But is there any evidence at this time that anything is going to change? 
I, I don't know. I, it's certainly not with uh, in the White House. I don't. I don't think. But but I don't know. I mean, the the interesting thing about this administration is I think they expected Republican pushback. They didn't expect pushback from the citizenry, whether it was at the town halls or the tea parties on spending or on health care. I think that really has taken them by surprise. So if the, the citizenry um, keeps uh, railing against this profligate spending, then I think we really do have a chance at, at turning things around. Because the, the loudest voices are coming not from talk radio or the internet or television or Congress. The loudest voices are actually coming from, from middle America. On your website, you have this quote from Thaddeus McCotter, Michigan yeah. congressman, about in his fourth term. I really dig S.E. because when going into political battle, best to bring a cup. Yeah, he's great. I mean, I don't know what that means. You know him? I do. I, I do know, know him. When I read it, I wondered, what does he mean? Is that his cup for money or cup, I don't for, know. cup for contributions? But that's Thad. I mean, he's so wonderfully kooky, um, also brilliant. And I think he's a real, he's a real uh, beacon for young conservatives. He has a lot of interesting ideas. He's doing things in a different way. I mean, he does red eye, you know, on, on Fox News. He's, he's got a different approach, and I how, think a lot of people are listening to how him. How much now. of a following? The red eye is rather, how would you describe it? It's, it's satirical. It's uh, Yeah, it's irreverent. It's irreverent. It's an irreverent right-leaning look at the news. So there's humor. It's on late night, so there's a little bit more leeway with what they can say. And it's it's hilarious, frankly. It's, it's satire and parody and actually um, just had a huge bump in the ratings over the past few months. I mean, people are really starting to, to take notice of it, which always makes me worried that they're going to start changing it. But I love doing that show because it's always a nice break from the Sort of hard, hard news. In your book, Why You're Wrong About the Right, and you had a forward with Tucker Carlson, mm -hmm. you go through your chapters, and, and each chapter is like, for instance, chapter one, Republicans are racist, mm -hmm. Republicans are elitist wasps, Republicans are humorless, and you obviously refute that. Debunk, right. But you wrote this in your introduction. You said, I am a longtime atheist pursuing a master's degree in religious studies. I find Hollywood repulsive, mm -hmm. but I'm totally addicted to PerezHilton.com. Right. I love to fish, but I'm afraid of the water. Brett, your co-author, is bored by art and rarely gets to a museum, but he himself is an amateur artist and photographer. <laughs> he hates Washington, D.C., but hopes to one day go into politics. In other words, we're just every day 20-somethings who happen to be conservatives. Yeah. And I think if I calculate it right, you're no longer a 20-something. I'm not. I'm 30 now. Thanks a lot for pointing that out. Sure. <laughs> I... <laughs> When you're my age, you you know, it's easy to point somebody yeah. out there. Anyway, I find Hollywood repulsive. Yeah. Why? I mean, the, yeah, the point of that was to say that we're contradictions and we're not the stereotypical anything. It's it's really easy to stereotype people, but, but uh, we're not. Hollywood's repulsive because Hollywood has absolutely no moral arbiters. No one in Hollywood is ever willing to stand up and say, this value system is better than this value system. So everything's relative. And uh, it's really just a, a, a refuse. I mean, it's a place for garbage. Um, I love the medium. I love film. I love television. But uh, as a culture, it's, it's devoid. I mean, it's, it's an abyss. And I really hate the reverence that we, we all tend to give it. How much... Uh... Feedback have you gotten on chapter 10 in your book? Which is it? Republicans are bad in bed. <laughs> um, we did not, right. So there's this myth that conservatives may be sort of prudish. Um, By the because way, what's wrong, what's wrong with being prudish? No, absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. But there's, there's the idea that because we're politically conservative, we then have to be conservative everywhere in our lives. Some of us certainly are, but some of us aren't. Um, so I think we less than systematically went through and, and debunked that one. It, you, you can't do it scientifically, of course, but Can I read some of this? Sure. Uh, picture this, New York City, 2003. Is this your chapter or your co-author's chapter? Did we, you write this? We wrote the book together. Okay. A hot summer night on the Upper East Side. You live in Chelsea, though. I do. That's downtown. Uh-huh. 
After several fish bowls of candied fruit juice and bottom shelf rum at Brother Jimmy's Bar, have you ever been there? I have. Two young, unattached, lusty 20-somethings head for a nearby apartment for some hurried foreplay and what will undoubtedly be sloppy and forgettable casual sex. Does, Sorry, Mom. <laughs> does Brett live up on the Upper East Side? Uh, no, he doesn't. Oh, okay. But we've both lived all over the city. I see, okay. After a glass each of a newly opened bottle of Rosemont Shiraz, is that, I've never heard that before. What is that? Uh, it's a it's a kind of red wine. It's an Australian red wine. And 13 minutes of Chappelle's show. Uh -huh. I mean, on DVD? Or, uh -huh. yeah, okay. They clumsily begin to fumble at each other's buttons, zippers, clasps, and laces while carefully crab walking, still conjoined at the face from the couch to the bed. Once there, in between boozy breaths and heavy petting, more reminiscent of the Three Stooges than of nine and a half weeks, the newcomer takes brief glances around the room. And while the owner of the apartment claws at the nightstand for a condom, a poster catches the other's eye, transfixing the vi visitor, now practically paralyzed with fear and confusion. The slapdash sex dance has begun, nevertheless, but mid-thrust, the guest simply cannot bear another moment. Quote, I can't do this. That thing scares, me, scares the S out of me. The owner of the bedroom looks up at the wall behind him, them, where a prized possession has been hung. The attractive stranger climbs off the bed and the bed's owner and begins to dress, leaving a panting, eager, and discreet participant alone on the bed, naked, mouth agape, mid coyote Sorry, the departing stranger says, leaping toward the door. Quote, I can't get off under a poster of George W. Bush. Right. That was a wonderful reading. Is that, thank you very much. Yes. Is that a true story? It's a compilation of a number of stories that as, as Manhattanites, we've heard over the years. So Some of the names and faces have been changed, have been changed. to now, protect the innocent. Did you get any feedback on that from your conservative followers? You know, I think most people appreciated that we can have a sense of humor about this kind of thing and that young conservatives can talk about sex without blushing. And I mean, it's, I, I don't think it was gratuitous or graphic. And we're certainly not running around talking about sex everywhere. Um, but but why do we talk about sex all the time in the society yeah. and get so out of bent out of joint? Say the David Letterman one. Just pick your pick your poison. Pick your Pick your conservative, pick your liberal. They all seem to get involved in the same thing, and we just go crazy, don't we, on television? Yeah, I mean, it's juicy stuff. And we just had people tune us out right now because I read that chapter. <laughs> I know. You know, it's juicy stuff. I get it. Um, Why is it juicy, though? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think we're always fascinated to ponder the, the private lives of public people. So whether it's Mark Sanford or... David Letterman, um, or, you know, Tom Cruise, wh wh whomever it is. I think we're always sort of interested in, in what they're doing behind closed doors. I don't how, know why. How'd your book do? It did well. I mean, we were nobodies when it, when it came out. Um, it was a first book at a time where there were lots of political books coming out just before the election. But it did well. I mean... Got a great publisher in Simon and & Schuster, and I have another book coming out with Simon & Schuster in the spring. And obviously, I mean, I've launched a, a very small and insignificant career off of this book. So, Threshold Editions, which mm -hmm. is a new imprint for Simon & Schuster. They used to have free press. and Right, it's Mary Madeline's imprint. So she's sort of overseeing the, the conservative imprint. Did she hire you for this? Yeah. Did she discover you for this? Um, no, I, we had an agent who... But you said that was tough to get. Very, very. It took eight months to get an agent who didn't respond to our queries with hate mail. I mean, it's a very liberal business, um, and they were just mortified to get this conservative pitch from two young Manhattanites in their very rarefied world. Um... So we were, we were routinely dismissed and very hostily until we found sort of a kindred spirit in our current agent, um, and he got us right into Simon & Schuster. So what's the next book about? Um, it, it's called Losing Our Religion, The Mainstream Media's Attack on Christianity, and it really explores the, 
what I consider to be a, the fringe media now, because they're not representative of the country anymore when 80% of the country is Christian and the mainstream media is railing against Christians, they can only be described as, as fringe and, Are you and doing it yourself? unrepresentative. Yeah, it's my own project. When, With a forward by Mike Huckabee. <laughs> now, I've got your first book here. Yes, you do. What year were, was this? I was in second grade, so I must have been, I don't know, 1986, 1985. And you write on the cover about the offer that Sarah was born in Carlsbad, California. She enjoys reading, astronomy, and dancing. This is her first novel. <laughs> I know. Who knew? And I actually just found that recently. I had completely forgotten about it. Um, You've got artwork in here that you did? Yep. Yeah. It's what? legit. It's a legit book. Look, and what's, what were you trying to say there? Do you remember? Um, I believe the main character, the protagonist of this particular book, um, has lost a very special ring. And so she's looking for this ring and can't find the ring. But I'd have to reread it to be, to be completely sure of the, the highs and lows of the plot. Okay, what's your guess? Uh, Ten years from now, mm -hmm. uh, will it still be S.E. Cup? Yes. Not Sarah or Elizabeth? Or... Sarah always to my family, but S.E. Cup professionally. Will you be married? I don't know. I don't think so. Why not? Um, it's just never been like a, a check, checklist goal. Will you have children? I don't know. I'm also ambivalent about kids right now. Will you live in New York? I doubt it. I doubt it. I imagine I'll be living on a ranch somewhere in Kentucky. Will you be writing? Yes, for sure. That's the definite. Yes. So in your own mind, though, what is your goal? Where do you want, what do you want SE Cup to be all about 10 years from now? I want a constant writing job. I want the constant opportunity to write about the things that I want to write about, whether that's in books or in columns, online. I'm not picky. Uh, for television, I mean, I really, I really just want the opportunity to write. So that's the only thing I do know. What I'll be writing about, where I'll be writing, I don't know. I'm, I'm open. We'll have you back in 10 and we'll check it out. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. For a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts, or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts. Next Sunday on Q&A, Reverend Barry Blake.